Yeah, so, all right. Well, boy, what a special privilege we've been given this morning. And uh, I was telling the men last night at uh, Men's Prayer Meeting, it's going to probably be an emotional time uh, for me, and I'm sure for you as well. As uh, Again, you think of how gracious God has been to us as a church. Amen. And uh, one of the main things that we see, especially in the early days, and especially this, the pattern that is set, amen, one of the main things the early church did, the early local church, the local body, amen, was that they took men whom God raised up in, in, from amongst them, and they sent them out, amen, they sent them out to uh, preach the gospel, to minister, we were, uh, Cody and I were talking just a little while ago uh, about what a wonderful thing it is that you can have men, and of course, I'm not leaving out their family, amen, but Dean is the leader of his family, God's called him to go, and his wife has submitted to that, amen, and uh, that is a wonderful, beautiful thing to, to behold, but it's wonderful to know that when they go, amen, number one, they're sound, amen, they're preaching sound doctrine, sound doctrine is so needful for us, and, and secondarily, I, I like that they, they go there and... They're an encouragement to the indigenous men who are there preaching. He's going to teach the other men, amen, and teach them how to preach the word. And it's such a wonderful blessing to be able to do that, amen. And uh, God has, you guys, I, I just can't tell you how important that is, how important that a local church support a missionary that they know, amen. amen. They know our sound. And that's what we're going to see this morning in this pattern in the book of Acts. In God's written communication, the inspired, amen, commentary on the early church. And so uh, I, I shouldn't have had you sit down yet. I want you to stand with me this morning as we read Acts chapter 13. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 13 this morning. The title of my message is Leaving Your Local Church the Way Saul or Paul and Barnabas Did. Amen. So let's look there together. Acts chapter 13. Look at verse number 1. We'll read the first Four verses together. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that is called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Manan, which had brought been brought up from uh, and brought up with Herod the tetrarch and Saul, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Ghost said, "That's very important." The Holy Ghost said, "Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them." And when they had, what's that next word? fasted, amen, and prayed, and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they being sent forth by who? The Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia. And from thence they sailed to Cyprus. Let's pray together this morning. Father, again, we know here from your preserved, inspired word, that which you have kept down through the annals of history and time, we have the 66 books within the canon, within the rule, your rule, Father, that you have designed for us to have. Every word in here is perfect. Every word in here is placed uh, for a reason. We believe in the verbal and the plenary inspiration of Holy Writ this morning, which means that we believe every word, and we believe that every word in every other book is just as authoritative as the ones we're reading this morning. Father, we thank you for that, and Father, we systematically are going to look this morning. Systematic uh, preaching is, is, is a wonderful thing. We get what the Bible says to us concerning these important matters. And uh, Lord, uh, again, I, I'm so thankful that our church would be so blessed by the hand of God, by the Holy Spirit, that you would give us an opportunity to, to do this be a part of this, to participate in this, to pray for them, to fast for them, and Father, to, uh, to send them out. And Father, we give you the praise and the glory for all of it. We ask now, Lord, as we open our Bibles together, as you speak to us through your word this morning, that Father, it would sink deep down into our ears, that Father, uh, for those of us who are saved this morning, that it would be certainly an encouragement to us, that we, Lord, that um, we, we can see again from the pattern laid out in Holy Writ, that this is your ordained will, uh, Father. And so we, we thank you for that. Father, for those who are here this morning, lost in their sin, sitting in darkness, not even knowing it, walking dead people is what the Bible calls them. Father, we pray that maybe today will be the day 
that the light of the gospel will come from the Father of lights, as we saw this morning, that it might illuminate their darkened hearts, that, Father, their eyes might be opened, the scales removed, that they might see the cross, the old bloody cross, for what it was and what it is. Father, they don't realize it, but the wrath of God that was poured out at the cross on the perfect, sinless Son of God, they are currently under that wrath. And Father, we thank you for the doctrine of substitution, that he took our place, that he suffered the wrath of God upon the cross and died there shedding his lifeblood and rose again from the grave. And through his finished work, the Christian. Those elect whom you called are imputed with that righteousness. We, we can't begin to even comprehend all of that. But Father, the Bible says it, so we believe it. It's true, and we cleave certainly unto the Lord concerning these things. So we pray this morning for them. They're on their way to a devil's hell and don't even realize it. Father, may you bring them and enlighten them, illuminate their darkened hearts that they might see the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask now and pray all these things in the name the Bible says that is above every name. The name the Bible says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess to the glory of God the Father. That powerful name in which the demons shudder, James tells us. The name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be uh, seated this morning again as we um, as we endeavor this morning to uh, through the weakness of my own flesh, amen, as we endeavor to have the power of the Spirit of God preach the word to us this morning. I, I just want to say, if, if you ever need to leave your local church, brethren, amen, we should want to always aspire to leave the way in which we're going to see this morning Saul and Barnabas left their local church. Listen, so often, brethren, when someone leaves a church, it's such a negative thing, amen, I mean, here there were no arguments. Imagine that. Hey, I think if we were persecuted a little more, we wouldn't argue about so much. Amen? We wouldn't worry about some of this small stuff that we seem to get sidetracked on. It's an amazing thing. Only in the West can that happen. Amen? If we were this morning concerned about the Gestapo or the Chinese government or somebody coming in to take one of our children to lop their heads off, we wouldn't argue and fight about the color of the carpet and everything else. Amen? We would be concerned about the holy things of God, which these men certainly were. There were no arguments, there was no backbiting or gossiping, amen? Boy, wouldn't that be nice to have, be a part of a Baptist church where there's no backbiting and no gossiping going on, amen? Wouldn't that be a wonderful, beautiful thing to have happen? No ill feelings, no hatred towards one another, and brethren, listen, as the pastor, no one was fired, amen? It's an amazing thing. This, brethren, was a divine call of God when he called them to go to where he was going to call them to go. Here, everyone agreed, brethren, that it was God's will for these men, two men to leave, even though they were loved, amen? And now, I know uh, we're not going to be doing any eisegetical putting people in there, but I don't know about you, but I love Dean and Sonia, amen? amen. They are loved by me and by this church and by our brethren that are here, amen? And yet we know and we understand that it is a call of God that calls a man and a family to go do those things. And so we rejoice in that. We're sad because we're going to miss them and miss his teaching and all those things that him and his family do here in this church, and yet we are so thankful, amen, that God would do that. Their ideal exit is ideal this morning. We find ourselves this morning really as we are in the book of Acts, which is God's inspired communication to us, amen, uh, concerning the early days of his church, as I said, amen. So if you want to be a New Testament church, amen, should we not turn to the inspired history of church history, and should we not look and go, what did that church do? What did that church look like? What did the men and the disciples in that church, what did they do? Amen? And this is what we are thankful this morning to have before us, the inspired communication of God. It's an amazing thing. Throughout the early days of the church, they witnessed the power of God. I mean, in some most unimaginable ways. They witnessed the power of the Holy Spirit of God working in those churches, amen? As the Holy Ghost, amen, as the Holy Spirit of God was uh, instituting and laying the foundation for which we stand on this morning, brethren. You understand this, don't you? 
It's an amazing thing. I want you to see this. Look at Acts chapter 2. We're going to lay just a little bit of a foundation, a context leading up to our passage this morning, which we must do. Look at Acts chapter 2. I want you to, again to see this with me, brother, if you would, this morning. Look at Acts chapter 2. The Bible says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were what? Filled with the Holy Ghost. You see that there. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there's power there. This is the whole, this is the idea, brother. This is where the power comes from. The Holy Spirit came upon them with cloven tongues, amen, and it gave them power to speak and utterance. Now let me just clarify something, brother. The, the tongues that we're talking about here are not the tongues you see on every charlatan TV show that's out there, every charlatan pastor, and they're, you know, uh, uh, say Kawasaki, Kawasaki, Yamaha, Yamaha. No, this is actually, brother, an, an audible language. If you go on and look there, it was a, an, a unique power by the Holy Spirit of God. It'd be like Dean going to India now, and he gets over there, and he's never studied the native language, and all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit would give him the power to speak in their native tongue. That's what tongues is. That's how it's defined in Holy Writ. It's not this gobbly goop barking like dogs and puking and all this trash. This is the power of the Spirit of God at work. This is what he did. I want you to see this, brother, as we look at this. They experienced such power of the Holy, by the Holy Ghost as it laid those foundations for them early on. Look at uh, verse 41. Look at Acts chapter 2. Look at verse 41. I want you to see the power of God at work. Verse 41 says, Then they gladly received his word, were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them, what? About 3,000 souls. Brethren, that's power. That's preaching. That's God, the Holy Spirit of God, drawing men unto himself. Have you ever seen 3,000 people be saved before? Well, I haven't seen that, but they did. They witnessed this power. There's great power as they preach the word to them, guys. Amen. This is the pattern that's laid out for us in Scripture. Let me show you just, look at Acts chapter 4 we got 3,000 here. Look over here at Acts chapter 4 as we lay, again, the groundwork. Verse 1, And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they, were taught, that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold for the next day. It was now eventide. How be it? Hey, this is one of the things I was telling Wendy yesterday. I was so emotional. I mean, I almost couldn't handle it. I couldn't hardly utter it. The words that I was that I've seen, the more you study the word, the deeper it gets, amen. And the more you learn, amen, that we might apply that depth, amen, to our own lives and to those around us. But you see here, hey, we're gonna put you in, we're gonna grab you, we're gonna take you in. Look what the Bible says there, if you would. How be it, many of them which heard the word, what? Believed, and the number of men was about what? Five thousand. That didn't include the women, but there's about 5,000 men there, and it's an amazing thing. Look at Acts chapter 5, just one more, as we see this incredible growth and the power in the, in the early church. Look at verse number 13, Acts chapter 5. Look at verse number 13. You want to see power, you want to see uh, the false converts not gathering together with the church. Here we see it. Look at verse 13. And, the, and of the rest, there's no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. Look at verse 14. And believers were made, uh, were the more added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. And so again, we see this idea here, this whole idea. The early church was clearly marked by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit of God himself. As he is working and drawing and doing those things that only the Holy Spirit can do. It's an amazing thing. Now listen, here, here's the thing. The people of God, brethren, when you read through the book of Acts and you see these great conversions, you see these missionary uh, journeys that they went on, you know what these men were busy doing? Listen, the people of God were busy about their father's business. Amen? They were holy. They were set apart. Amen? I mean, brothers, instead of the church looking like the world, they were set apart. The world didn't even dare come near them. They were holy and set apart. 
The Lord Christ was being preached and God was being glorified. This is what you see as they are preaching and doing their business, doing the Father's business. They were holy people about God's holy business, preaching his holy word that the Holy Spirit might bring some to the holy what? Faith. This is what they were doing. This is what they were busy doing. The church was growing. And we see, listen, this is the beautiful thing about preaching the word. We see the effectual working, the effectual power, listen, brother, on both the saint and the sinner. <coughs> you understand that. You do not soften your message to try and woo the sinner. You simply preach the message, you preach the word, and God will do his bidding. Mm -hmm. Amen? We see here in the early church that that was happening. There were those who were being added to the Lord. There were those who wouldn't dare join themselves to the church because of the power of the Holy Spirit there that was present while this was going on. And of course we all know, don't we, brethren, that the God-ordained rapid growth of this church was a burr under the saddle of some. That's maybe some North Dakota language, amen? A little burr under the saddle out west there, amen? Uh, Cody and Kayla could probably relate to that. They were not too happy about what was taking place, about this glorious living organism called the church having this explosive growth. And so in Acts chapter 4, Luke records that the priests, which we read, the captain of the temple and the Sadducees, arrested some of the apostles, amen? And then when they tried to forbid them from preaching in Jesus the resurrection, that didn't work very well, did it? No, oh, it's an amazing thing you see here, amen? So they arrested and tried and stoned Stephen to death, the first martyr of the New Testament. And another devilish effort for them to stem the growth of the church. And when that didn't work, th th this is really something, when I was studying this out, I kept seeing them trying to stop the growth of the word, trying to stop the preaching of the word, trying to stop the growth of the church. And those evil, devilish men tried everything they could. In fact, by the time it was all over, we see here that they went one more step and they said, what we're going to do is we're going to hire our hired gun named Saul of Tarsus. Saul will take care of it for us, won't he, brethren? Let's send Saul out. Well, what was Saul doing when they sent him out? Let's look at that together. Look at Acts chapter 7. Look at Acts chapter 7. Again, I, I call this uh, one of the greatest concoctions of a man-made failure ever written in Holy Writ. It's an amazing thing. Hey, if this doesn't work, if that doesn't work, if the stoning doesn't work, we're going to call, we'll call in Saul of Tarsus. We'll send him out and sick him on those men of those people of the way. Amen? Look at verse 58 of Acts chapter 7. Again, bringing us to the stoning of Stephen. This is very important, brethren. This, again, is sovereign God's hand at work. As I studied this out, it was just amazing to me to see how God uses everything to his glory. Everything. Look what it says there, verse 58. And cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was what? Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Look at Acts chapter 8. Let's flip over just one chapter there, the beginning, Acts chapter 8. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time there was great what? Persecution against the church was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Look at Acts chapter 9, verse 1. We see again, we're going to get, we're going to get our hired gun, Saul of Tarsus. We're going to have him go out and kill some people. We're going to have him go out and put some people in prison. That'll stop it. Look at verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and what? Slaughter against the church, or against the disciples of the Lord went unto the high priests and desired him letters to, uh, to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. So here again, we see this devilish attack against the church and these religious uh, devils getting their minions together, sending out Saul, except we see God who is sovereign, God who is omnipotent, God who reigns supreme above all actions. We know how this worked out, didn't we? don't we? Look there, if you would, the Apostle Paul, or Saul, as he's on his way. Look at verse 15 and 16 of Acts chapter 9. We know the Lord appeared to him on the road to Damascus. Look at verse 15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a, what? Chosen 
vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. For while I will show him how much ease he should have, how much gold he should have in his pocket, how much of this and that he should have. No, actually, how much he shall what? Suffer for my name's sake. Amazing, is it men and their devilish tricks? We're going to arrest this guy. We're going to stone that guy. In fact, we're going to send out our hired gun. And you know what God does? God sovereignly overrides his chosen vessel to go and preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Brethren, that is the most amazing thing to me as we look at this. Hey, listen. When Jesus said, I think Howard quoted it this morning. Somebody did. I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall never, ever prevail against it. Amen. No matter what wicked, demonic thing men may dream up, no matter what the Supreme Court says, no matter what the down in Wisconsin now, there's a judge trying to get on the court down there, and he can't get on there, he should be disqualified because he's a Bible-believing Christian. No matter what men think, God, omnipotent, shall reign supreme. Amen? Yes, he will. We see that here. Now, God's inspired communication to us this morning leads us, brethren, to a most wonderful scene in the book of Acts as we're laying the groundwork. Now listen, it's a wonderful music to our ears. Any Gentiles in here this morning? Any Gentiles? I don't think, yeah, I, I, I'm a Gentile and uh, I don't think we have any, you know, uh, Jews sitting amongst us this morning. This should be wonderful, beautiful music to your ears, brethren, because it brings us to this majestic scene of the founding by God himself of the first Gentile church in Scripture. It's an amazing thing. Now, what I want you to notice, what I want you to see in this, is the causation and who is there. The causation of this first Gentile church that's established by God in Antioch. And I want you to see this. Look at Acts chapter 11. Again, as we're leading up to where we're at. Look at Acts chapter 11. You remember the stoning of Stephen? You remember that, right? They thought for sure that would stop the church. That would quell the church. Actually, sovereign God again at work establishing a church in Antioch. Look here, if you would, look at verse number 19. Look at Acts chapter 11. Look at verse 19. The Bible says, Now they, were, they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose from who? Stephen. You see that? God is amazing. These men stoned him, thought they were going to stop the church. And what does God do? He simply says, oh yeah, my, 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 my disciples are going to get dispersed. And then we're going to start a church at Antioch because of what them men did. Those evil men stoning Stephen. It's an amazing thing when you think about this, brethren. And you think this through. As Dean and Sunday, we've been praying and fasting and asking God just to, to honor that work, which he's going to do, brethren. God will reign supreme in all matters. Look at there. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching their own ideas, preaching their own thoughts. No, actually preaching the word to none but the Jews only. And again, we see this here, brethren. Now, what I want us to do is, I don't even know if this is a word. Hey, we may have to put it in our lexicon. Let us transport ourselves. That's a word, isn't it? I want to transport ourselves one year into the future in the book of Acts, which takes us, brethren, this morning to our scripture passage we're in. Amen? Look at Acts chapter 13. One year uh, advanced. And we see here at verse number 1, look how Luke, under the inspiration of God, starts this passage. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain what? Prophets and teachers. Now, brethren, the first thing Luke records for us this morning is that there were prophets and teachers in the church at Antioch. Now let me just say this, amen? These are two providentially ordained offices by God himself. This is why he starts it out this way. If you're going to have a New Testament Bible-believing church, you've got to have some men that can preach, and you got to have some men who can teach. Amen? God has to raise them up, ordain them to come to be, to be leaders in the church. You know, Howard and Dean and myself and some other men, uh, Keith, do some teaching and that kind of a thing. Hey, listen, that doesn't happen by accident. They come to the church. You recognize that. 
Now, let me just clarify something here this morning before we get too wild and crazy on this. In the early church, the prophets were preachers used by God to proclaim his direct revelations. You understand this, that in the early church before the canon was put together, God used prophets to come. He did it in the Old Testament. He did it here in the New Testament as well to preach direct revelations to the church. Amen? And I want you to see this so you don't think I'm making this up because I'm, I'm not. Boy, we could spend a whole lot of time here in the book of Acts, couldn't we? Look there, if you would. Look at uh, Acts chapter 11 again. Just back up there just a little bit. And I want you to see this. Look at verse number 27. Uh, look at verse number 27. The Bible says, And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. And there stood up one of them named what? Agabus. And signified by the Spirit that there should be a great dearth in the land, amen, throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. So here we have a prophet in the early church standing up and saying, hey, by the Spirit of God who told me this, there's going to be a great dearth in the land, a great famine. And you know what happened? There was a great dearth and a great famine in the land. We know that because of the gift then that was sent up to the church to those who were poor, amen. Look at one more again. Just, just again, just to lay the ground. Uh, Agabus shows up again in Acts 21. Look over there with me, if you would. Look at Acts chapter 21. Again, the prophets were preachers used by God in the early church to bring and to preach his direct revelation from the Spirit of God. Look at Acts 21. Look at verse number 10. Acts 21. Look at verse number 10. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain what? prophet named Agabus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith what? Myself? Thus saith this guy over here? No, thus saith the Holy Ghost. This is a direct revelation from the Holy Ghost to the church. So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. We see in the early church a unique office of these prophets that God used by direct revelation from the Holy Spirit of God to preach things to the church. Now, do we have prophets in the church today? You can say yes. Don't be afraid to do that. But the prophets that you have today are pastors and elders who preach the word of God that's here. Amen? We reveal to you, we try and teach you what God has said. It's not, I don't sit at home in the middle of the night. You can ask my wife. I don't sit at home in the middle of the night, and then she gets woke up by a light bulb that comes on above my head. And I say, hey, God just spoke to me. This is what he wants me to preach. That doesn't happen. I'm not Agabus, and neither are you. But by the studying, by the hearing of the word, by the preaching of the word, that's what a prophet is today in the New Testament church, as the apostles, with their special gifts, listen, I, don't, I can't give you my handkerchief and have you be healed. Believe you me, if I could, I would. I would march up to the hospital. I would have marched up last Friday. I would have went out to a Mayo Clinic where a friend of mine's uh, of ours, their 10-year-old son lay dying. And he did die. I would have taken that handkerchief or my shadow and I would have went there and I would have healed that little boy. The apostles had the ability to do that. The early prophets were spoken to by God directly direct revelation, which they wrote, which got canonized, and here we are this morning, brethren, preaching the word of God, which they wrote, were inspired to write. It's an amazing thing. Now the teachers, which is what we do today, Howard did it this morning, were used by God to explain those revelations. Now this is what's important. Again, the teacher's role here really hasn't changed. Our role as teachers, then, is to explain the word of God to you. Listen and to help apply those things to your and my life. That's the role of a teacher. That's part of what we are to be doing this morning in Sunday school, which we did, and preaching this morning, is to teach you the Word of God and help you and myself to apply what we hear to our own lives, brethren. This is the role of a teacher. It's very, very important. Um, I'm not here to tell you how good you are. Amen? Because I know how good I'm not. I know how good you aren't either. Amen? There's none that good. There's none good. No, not one. There's none to seek out. They go, no, not one. <laughs> Unless you're unique, and I don't think you are. 
down through the annals of the history of time. Amen. So we see there that, uh, back to Acts chapter 13, verse number 1, we had certain prophets and teachers there. Now, I want you to notice here, that, again, this is just an amazing thing to me, as God is working out his perfect plan for the missionary work that he is preparing them for. Look here, I want you to see the five men who are named there that the Holy Spirit instructed Luke to put down. There's a reason, I believe, again, in the plenary and verbal inspiration, I believe every word, and I believe this is authoritative and needful as anything else in Holy Writ, right? You've read the book of Numbers, haven't you? Amen? You've read some of that stuff where they're going down through the, through the uh, uh, even in some stuff in Leviticus, right? And you go, man, what? What? Why am I reading this? Why, why did God put this in there? Because he's God, and there's a reason, and that's what I'm saying. That book, Numbers, is just as authoritative and powerful as what we're reading this morning. And so he put these five men here for a reason. Look at the five. We, we've looked at, you know, so far we've been introduced to Barnabas as he starts out there. Saul is named last. But it's the men in the middle that I would like for us to just take note of, because many of us don't know who Simeon, that is called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch. So let's just discuss these men for just a moment, amen. Simeon called Niger, listen, you want some, can I just, you know, let's get unpolitically correct this morning, shall we? Amen. Anybody want to join me? Hey, listen, if you want social justice, if you want diversity at your church, then you do what these men did, amen? Because, you know, Simeon from Niger, you know what he was? He was a Jewish black man. That's what he was. Here he was saved by God, and God brought him in by the preaching of the word, not me trying to repay you reparations for something I didn't even do. I'll tell you, I'm not chasing, I almost chased the rabbit. You want to see a denomination... Uh, the flush has been done. All you're seeing now is the swirling of it, of the SBC. You want to see something swirling and going down the proverbial toilet? Go on pulpit and pen this week. See what their leader's up to. And I, it, it's, it's coming out. I'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet. But it's going exactly as I said it would be. He threatened everybody. If you don't follow along with this social justice stuff, you're out. You know what, buddy? I'm out long before you ever said that threatening us. You little devil. That's what they are. You stick to the gospel, you preach the gospel, and you know what? There will be black people who get saved. There will be Chinese people that get saved. There will be all kinds of men, as God calls them to. Uh, but I'm not going to sit and repay them reparations for something I have nothing to do with, which has nothing to do with the gospel, because money isn't going to help them one bit. It's a stunning thing, but well, I could change that. I'm not going to. I almost did. <coughs> third guy there is Lucius from Cyrene. He was a Latin Christian. Amen. You want a, you want a little, uh, little uh, diversity there. Now, Manian is an interesting character. This is really interesting to me as I studied this out. The Bible says there, if you pay careful attention, that Manian, which had been brought up in the, with who? Herod the Tetrarch. Anybody know who Herod the Tetrarch was? You remember Herod the Tetrarch, the guy that beheaded John the Baptist? That's, this guy was his foster brother. Think of this for a moment. Here we got Menin, who was under the Herod the Tetrarch. Here's God, a man living under a devil who beheaded the preacher that came to tell the good news that Christ is coming. Amen? He's the Elijah that was to come. Off with his head. Amen? And right in his own palace. Right in his own palace, brethren. Listen. God's elect was grabbed and picked right out of there, out of this place where a man who, who the devil used to lop off John the Baptist's head. Now, this is interesting as I study this out again. You cannot stop the sovereign hand of God at salvation. I don't care where you're at. There's another person, and I want you to see this. Again, God simply plucking out right from underneath the devil's nose those who were right in the house of Herod. And I want you to see the other one. Look with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 8. Let me show you this. This is wonderful. Brethren, this is why you preach the word. This is why we stick to the word. I know I sound like a broken record sometimes. 
It's the power of the word. Look at here, Luke chapter 8. Look at verse number 2. And certain women, which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. Look at verse 3. And who? Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod's what? Steward. You know what a steward was? A steward was his personal attendant. A steward was, here we have God. Taking, amen, here we have God just taking Manian and little Joanna, plucking them right out from underneath, amen. It, it to me, is just a stunning thing. Here's Herod trying to stop the preaching. Here's Herod, because, you know, how dare John the Baptist say, hey, buddy, you can't be with your brother's wife. You're a wicked sinner. Well, I can't have that. We're going to shut him down, man, right now. Well, you say that today, and who the heck, don't they just come out? I mean, it's just, it's fun to watch it. Hmm? Hey, as Brother Cody prayed this morning, it's a husband and a wife. That's the God-ordained order of things. Amen? Here we have little Herod, the little devil, a little wicked sinner. Here's God going, I, I, I just puff at you. I puff at you. In fact, I'm going to take one of your own right out of from underneath your own house, you devil. To me, that is all. Well, listen, I could harp on this for a while. But it is an amazing thing. God plucks his elect from wherever they are. And we see that there. Now, look at the, look at the next thing there in Acts chapter 13. Look at verse number 2. I want you to see this. And this really is a most needful thing for the church today. It's a little word there. But unfortunately, it's a little word that, uh, that men have moved away from. Look at verse Acts 13. Look at verse number 2 there. As they, what? What's that next word? Ministered to the Lord. Brethren, that word minister, as I said, is a most needful word for the church today. You know what I mean? I mean, it's an amazing thing. Many Western churches are busy about many things. <laughs> you ever notice that? You ever go on their website? I go on their website to see what they're busy about. You know what they're busy about, a lot of them? Hey, paint splashing parties and a bunch of, just a bunch of trash. They're busy about so many things except the very thing that this word means. The word minister here is a most amazing word. It refers to one who is busied with holy things. Can, can I say that again? It's a word that means one who is busied with holy things. Do our churches not need, do we need to ask ourselves, are we busy about the holy things of God? <clears throat> this is what the word means. When you call yourself a minister, you are ministering the holy things of God. This is what Paul is doing here. This is what uh, Luke is telling us here. It's an amazing thing. It has the idea of a person engaged in the public ministries of God. Let me just show you a couple of you. Look at Romans real quick. Look at Romans chapter 15. Let me show you this here. The Apostle Paul, he says this here. Again, I don't want you to think I make it up, because I'm not making this stuff up, brethren. I wouldn't get up here and lie to you. Look at Romans 15. Look at verse number 15. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort is putting you in mind, because of the grace that was given to me of God, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. Listen, ministering the what? The gospel of God. This is what Paul said. I'm busy. The church should be busy. The church at Antioch was busy ministering the holy things of God. Is our church busy this morning ministering the holy things of God? I pray we are. And sending out, amen, a missionary is one of those holy things that we should be ministering and doing. Amen. Not only that, not only should we be preaching the gospel, ministers of the gospel, we should be ministering one to another. Do you understand? This is so important, isn't it? I should this morning be ministering unto you, and you should be ministering unto me. Amen? This is why oh, I could go off on another trail. This is why, brethren, you must never, ever, ever put the church third on your priority list ever. We have a most important thing that we're doing this morning. Okay, I'm going to get critical for a second. Howard told me to settle down. Pat told me to settle down. 
We are doing something that's been God-ordained this morning. By having a family come, we're going to do what they did in the Bible. We're going to lay their hands on them. We're going to commission them out to go. Amen? You tell me what's more important this morning than that. What's more important that your keister's at home? You should be here right now, ministering unto the brethren. We have an important ministry that we're going to do, and you choose to stay home. Shame on you. I'm shaming everybody publicly, okay? Shame on you. Your home doesn't come first. Your children don't come first. No, they don't. The Lord Jesus Christ come first. And this morning, we are going to be privileged to ordain, or not ordain, but to commit. There's a difference. We're going to look at this. Commission someone to go into the mission field. And you chose not to be here. Shame on you. May God take whatever you're cherishing and destroy it. Amen? Oh, that's harsh. You know what? We need to be a little more harsh, maybe. You need to pray God will put some, something down in your, in your soul. Crazy. Paul is saying that he busied himself with the holy things of God. We, too, must be busy with the holy things of God, ministering one to another. Now, look back there at Acts chapter 13. Again, we're going to just uh, tie two verses together here, Acts chapter 13. I want us to uh, finish up verse number 2 and then bring in, tie in part of verse number 3 for us this morning. Acts 13, look at verse number 2. The Bible says, as they ministered, as they were about the holy things of God to the Lord, they did two things. Look at it. They what? Fasted. Amen? They fasted there. Now listen, the Holy Ghost said, separate to me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto uh, I have called thee. Verse 3, and when they fasted, amen? So the idea here, what, what, what we're seeing, what the Bible is saying, Luke reveals to us this morning, brethren, the seriousness of the matter at hand. When he tells us that they've ministered unto the Lord and fasted and prayed, the biblical truth of fasting, <laughs> again, brethren, a lost art. Something that the church should certainly recoup. Amen? The idea of biblical fasting is found 50 times in Holy Writ. This is not something that is taken lightly in the Old Testament or the New Testament. Biblical fasting is simply this, brother. Biblical fasting is denying yourself food. Listen, not just to deny yourself food. Anybody here got lost children? Anybody here got, got, a, got an issue that they're trying, they're trying to deal with? Amen? There has to be a... It's denying yourself for a spiritual reason. For a spiritual purpose. Denying yourself. And you know what I've noticed? And, and I, You're supposed to do things in secret, okay? But I'll just use an example. Listen, when you fast, not if you fast, when you fast, when you get hungry, you know what you should do? I'm just going to tell you, this is what I do. Whatever the spiritual reason it is that I'm fasting, you know what I pray about? I pray about that. Every time a hunger pain comes, I think of my children. Whenever a hunger pain comes, I think of my in-laws. I pray for them. Or there might be a situation, but that is what biblical fasting is. It's denying yourself for a spiritual reason. You don't fast because you're... Well, I don't know what the word I could use. What's the politically correct word for people who might be overweight a little bit? That's not why you do that. You do it for spiritual reasons, brother. And when it comes to your mind, you pray and you deny yourself. Listen, Nehemiah fasted. Nehemiah fasted for confession. He fasted for repentance. He fasted that God would give him favor to build the walls. Remember? He fasted and prayed. Mordecai and the Jews fasted and prayed when they heard what little old what's his devil was going to do, amen? When Haman come up with his plot, they, they turned to God and they fasted and prayed concerning the matter when they heard it. David fasted and prayed, amen? The Lord Jesus and his disciples all fasted and prayed. And we see here in our text that the early church fasted and prayed. And I want to just give us a couple of examples, okay? Again, this is something that we see in Holy Writ, that is an example for you and I. It's something you and I should be doing. Our church should be doing it, especially now. We're sending out a man and a woman and his family.
to a hostile place. It's not like, friend, yeah, I, I, uh, I've been called to the mission field. Oh, where are you going? Uh, well, Arizona. Right, Wendy? That's not a call. That's, that's, not a, that's an enjoyment for me. Amen? Look at Acts chapter 10. Just back up one little couple of chapters there. I just want you to see. We remember Cornelius. Verse 30, Acts chapter 10, look at verse number 30. And Cornelius said, four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house. Here we can have an example of men uh, fasting and praying concerning spiritual things, brother. This, this is a must. This is a must. There is a purpose and a reason why we do these things. Look at one more just for fun. Look at Acts 14. Look at Acts chapter 14. The, the, the utter importance of putting elders in place in a church. Look at verse 23. And when they had ordained them elders in every church, and had prayed with what? Fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. This is an important ministry work. This is the holy thing of God that the people of God should be doing. Amen? Praying and fasting. Can I ask you a question? If you as a believer don't do it, who's going to do it? You know, prayer was given to the believer alone. It's a, it's a wonderful thing that we pray for one another. And it's not given to anyone else. It's given to the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, look back at Acts 13. We'll, uh, what do I got? Four pages left? Not so bad. It's not so bad. Amen? Look at Acts chapter 13. Let's again, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll just kind of move along, finish this up. Look at Acts chapter 13. Now, I want to, again, combine as I go back to verse 2 and verse 4, because the Holy Spirit is mentioned. And as we said earlier, this is the power. This is where the power comes from. Verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit, brethren, what's that next word? Said. Now, not only did he say, I want you to see what he did. Look at verse number 4. The Holy Spirit said, I want these two men set apart. So he chose them. Now verse 4. So they being sent forth by the what? Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost sent these men through. The Holy Ghost chose them. The Holy Ghost sent them forth. This is why it's important this morning as we participate in a commissioning, not an ordaining. Okay? There's a big difference between that. And we're going to see that here. The Holy Spirit of God, the Bible says. Uh, brethren, listen. Can I just say this? This missionary uh, trip was not figured out in the back room of some Sunday school, amen, listening to some jerk talk about the unreached people groups. Man, I hate that word. I hate that. Anybody that's unreached is an unreached people group. And you know what you do? You go and preach to the ones God sends you to. It doesn't matter what they are. Unreached people groups. What a bunch of nonsense. This was led and orchestrated by the Holy Spirit of God himself. I want Paul and Barnabas to go here specifically. I want them to go preach here and preach there and preach here and preach there. That's why this is so important. Can I just say this? That a man in his flesh will never Take his wife and their whole brood. One, two, three, four, five at this point. A man in his flesh will never take his wife and his children to a place where they're going. This has to be spirit organized, spirit led, and spirit sent. Do you understand this? Snakes. Pat and I were talking about the snakes. We were talking about... Just the weather. Hot. Sweaty. It's 40 below here this morning. In a couple days it'll be 100 and whatever it's going to be over there. The weather's different. Listen, the diseases and different things like that, you don't do that unless it's Holy Spirit led and orchestrated. Do you understand that? This was not something dreamt up by men. This was God calling them. And I believe in my whole heart this is God calling them once again to India. The burden that they have on their hearts to preach and teach those men and women how to teach the Bible is an incredible thing. You don't do that in your flesh. You know how you do it? You do it by 
being filled with the Holy Spirit of God. That's how you do it. Let me give you a couple verses here. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it all starts there. Jesus tells them, you stay here in Jerusalem, you'll be filled with what? You'll, be, you'll receive the power of the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 4, verses 7 through 8, I'll give you the verses, go look them up. The Bible says that Peter was filled with the Holy Ghost. Peter stood up and preached on the day of Pentecost. He was threatened with his life. We're going to throw you in jail. And he said, you judge for yourself whether or not we should preach this Lord Jesus Christ. We're not going to please you. We're going to please him. Amen. You don't do that in your flesh. You do that by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Stephen, which I want to turn to, look at Acts chapter 6. I want you to see this. In Acts chapter 6, we know this is one of the first occasions where deacons are chose in the church. In verse number 3, the Bible says, Wherefore, brethren... Look ye out among seven men of honest report, full of what? The Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Look at verse 5. And, and the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man, what? Full of faith and of the what? The Holy Ghost. Now I want you to notice this, brethren. He's called as a deacon. The Bible says he's full of the Holy Ghost. That's power. Turn with me to Acts chapter 7 towards the end of the chapter, and I want you to see this. Not only is he filled with the Holy Ghost when he's chosen as a deacon. I want you to see this. Look at Acts chapter 7. Look at verse 54. He just got done preaching to them. Basically almost the same sermon Paul preached a little later on. He's given them a history of them rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ, their Savior. Bible or Verse 55 of Acts chapter 7. But he... Being full of what? The Holy Ghost looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus Christ standing at the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Look down there at verse 58. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witness laid, uh, laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And I like what one pastor said. Stephen was just as full of the Holy Ghost when he was called as a deacon. I kind of like deacon work. I mean, I've, I've done some of that. You, some of you men have too. I like that deacon work. But you know what? When he's really full of the Holy Ghost, when you know the Holy Ghost is there, is when someone's picking up a stone to bash your head in. And the Bible says he was full of the Holy Ghost. That's power. You don't do that in your flesh. No more than you go over to India in your flesh. It's an amazing thing, brother. And it's over and over. The Bible says, we read there, Acts chapter 11, Barnabas was full of the Holy Ghost. In Acts 13, 8 through 10, the Bible says, Paul was filled with the Holy Ghost. That's the power. This is why we do what we do. Brethren, as I said, you don't take your perfectly healthy family to India in your flesh. Snakes, sickness, adversity, trouble on every side. You go because the Holy Spirit has called you there. This is absolutely, I believe, in my whole heart. Now, let's finish up here. Look at Acts chapter 13. Look at verse number 3. And uh, I wanted to finish with verse number 3 because this is important. All right. Look what it says there. And when they had fasted and prayed, and what? Laid their hands on them. They sent them away. This is very important. It's important for us to remember, brethren, just like Brother Dean and his family, all right? It's important for us to remember that Saul and Barnabas at this point had already been, had already been busy about the holy things of God for about eight years. This is important. So this is not an ordination to go. Like this morning, it's not an ordination to go because Brother Dean's been there on several occasions. What we're seeing unfolding here, brethren, is, is a commissioning, if you will. Listen, I like what one pastor said. He said, this is not an ordination because, it's what, uh, because they had already experienced the ordination of the pierced hands. For eight years, they've been in dire straits and they've been persecuted and all these things. It's an amazing thing. This is rather, listen, their fellow servants at Antioch expressing their identification with them in this Holy Ghost-led commissioning. And I want to just let you know that that phrase sent them away. Listen, this is why it's important to dis distinguish between a commissioning and an or ordination. That statement that's made there, uh, the Bible, if you read there in Acts chapter, in Acts chapter 3, verse no or Acts 13, verse number 3, they laid their hands on them and sent them away. It almost sounds like they 
they push them off. But literally, that phrase there literally means this, brethren. It means to let them go, to set them free. So in other words, what they did is the church gathered around. They knew that God had called them. They were all in agreement with that. They were going to be sad, and yet they knew the glorious fruit that would come from the sending. And the Bible says there, the church gathered around together, laid their hands on there, and set them free to go. Brethren, this is what we're doing this morning. Brother Dean and his wife have been there. They've been, they've, they've been ordained to go by God. What we want to do this morning here in just a moment is uh, I'm going to have them come forward. And I want the church to come. Are we a New Testament church? I think so. Don't we want to do what they did in the New Testament church? They commissioned Paul and Barnabas, and you read, read later on at the end of their missionary work in Acts 14, verse number 26, the Bible says they came back together and they rehearsed all that God had done there through that missionary work. And I'm looking forward, Lord willing, aren't you, to hearing Dean when, when they come back in six months and rehearsing in our ears all that God has done through the missionary brethren, through the work that we have supported, that we've given to, that we've prayed for, that we've fasted for, that we've ministered unto them as they've ministered unto us. Amen? So I want to pray this morning, and then I'm going to ask uh, Brother Dean and your family if you would come, and uh, um, we'll pray for you guys, and uh, looking forward to the work the Lord is going to be doing over there as he sends you there. So let's, let's pray together this morning. Father, again, we rejoice with you this morning. We are in total agreement. If, if someone's going to leave a church, they should leave just like Saul and Barnabas did. No fighting, no, no bad ill works, no bad ill feelings, no, none of that stuff. They left because you called them, the Holy Spirit of God called them to go. And Father, we are convinced the same is here with us this morning. Father, we thank you for the work they're going to be doing, and we thank you for their faithfulness this morning. And it's not of their own doing. Because the Spirit of God is there. He's saying, set them aside. I've called them. I'm going to send them forth. And we are just a vessel in which we can be a part of that. Father, again, we love you and thank you so much for your loving kindness to us this morning. We ask now as we ask some of the folks to come forward. And Father, as we lay our hands on them uh, and do what they did here in Acts chapter 13. Father, that uh, you will be honored, that you will be glorified in that, and you'll use them to, to your glory and to your grace. We ask and I'll pray these things in Jesus' name, all God's people say. Amen. All right, well, Brother Dean, if I could have you guys come.